Well, top of the morning. It's great to be back. And uh, I just want to give out a great blessing to everyone who has contacted me this week and those who have uh, subscribed to the actual YouTube videos. I just feel really blessed that people are wanting to uh, listen to messages about the grace and the love of God. And it's important to know that I do not have all of this worked out. I really don't. I'm on a journey and I'm trying to discover the reality of what grace really is to us who believe. And what I'm just longing every day to understand the greatness of the love of our Father. Because I believe that love will help us overcome in every circumstance, in every difficulty, in every trial, in every uh, situation that we find our lives in. And we, we, we come up against so many different things in life. And I've been speaking with some people this week and, and they're not Christians. And when I'm speaking to them and they're sharing with me about the day-to-day -day life, even though I go through the same things myself, there's a sense of hopelessness that's really stirring in so many people. And I think we've become social media crazy. We're all addicted so much to social media that it's really got a hold of our hearts. It's got a hold of our kids' hearts, my kids' hearts. Social media, you just cannot stop 24-7. Garbage being rammed down my, my mind into my heart, into your mind, your heart, and into our children's minds and hearts. And I just really feel today, above all days, I've just really had a great sense of God really wanting to reveal his love to his people. Because there is a great sense of hopelessness and it's stirring in so many. And we, the people of God, the church of Jesus Christ, the blood-bought church, the church of that has just been redeemed by the precious blood of our, of our Saviour and by our Heavenly Father. We have a message that is filled with so much hope. It is. It's got so much hope. And people need hope when, when things are seeming so hopeless. And I'm praying that today I do have a message that I've been thinking on today. And... Um, I just really ho I hope <laughs> that I get across this message of hope. The hope the Father loves us. He loves us. He's crazy about us. He can't stop thinking about us. The Bible actually says that our Father, our God, sings over us. He's singing. I, I kind of stop sometimes and try to think, what are you singing? What is it that you sing? But... The song, of the melody of God's heart is a melody of love. And he wants it to echo and resound in the very innermost beings of us. He really does. He needs to us to know. Love, God himself, is not a theology. And so many people, I get tired of, I've done it myself for years, sitting around talking about God and building your muscle biceps of, of biblical knowledge and flexing them for everyone to see and yet the more I seem to know about the love of God the more I grow in the love of God I feel humbled by it I feel I know so little and uh, today I want to just encourage you about the love of God again and next week I'm going to encourage you about the love of God again because to speak about God we are speaking about love, agape love, because the Bible says God is, lo is, is, is love. God himself is love. And as I always said, he doesn't just have love. He doesn't just dispense it here and there. No, he is. His very essence is love. And so everything that I want to think about, and when I am, I said last week, when I'm trying to break down the scriptures, I'm trying to keep at the very centre of my thinking and at the core of my being that you are love. And I discover the heart of God, not just throughout the New Testament, but even throughout the Old. And I see love. 
love demonstrating itself over and over and over again and so i want to encourage you so today i'm going to be reading a few verses from romans chapter 5 and hopefully we can get this across this is not a theological message i'm not a theologian i just love the word of god i love my father and i love thinking on the word of god and allowing him to speak to me through the holy spirit and so let's read from romans chapter 5 and take it from there so romans chapter 5 verse 1 says therefore having been justified by faith we have peace with god how through our lord jesus christ we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. We are standing right now in the grace of God. He has given us our introduction. By faith we have entered in. We have entered in to this grace by which we now stand. We stand in the grace of God. We stand in the hope of his grace continually. And it's a river that runs continually and it makes us glad. I like that scripture in Revelations and it talks about the river that flows from heaven and it makes his church glad. It makes us glad and we have glad hearts because we now stand in the grace of God. Through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult, we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance brings about, or tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope, this is the verse I'm going to focus on, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the holy precious precious gentle spirit the love of god has been poured into our hearts by the precious holy spirit if i was uh, rewriting this bible i'd put precious gentle holy spirit in there and hope does not disappoint because the love of god has been poured out within our hearts through the holy spirit who was given to us for while we were still helpless or in a lot of versions it says for while we were still without strength when we were helpless hopeless we were without strength for while we were without strength at the right time christ died for the ungodly christ died for the ungodly whenever i think about justification by faith i, I always I've listened to a lots of people talk about what justification is and um, I've also had my own understanding of what ju justification was. It's very cliche and, and very simple. But justification by faith has become, it's become an enormous <laughs> thing to me now. I realise I wrote down here what justification is to me very simply and you may not agree with what I write. But that's okay. This is how I am expressing what justification is to me. Justification is God my Father, who is love, awakening me, his creation, to the truth that he has removed sin and my conscious guilt because of sin and making me, who was unrighteous, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And it goes beyond the borders of even my understanding of words. I don't really have all, I'm very illiterate, I never went to school really. And so I, I'm limited to the amount of words that I could use. But my spirit, it grabs me in my spirit and I get those tingles on the arms. <laughs> because justification has brought peace with God. Because my mind was at war with God. My mind had no peace about who I was, where I was going. And I had no peace. God was not at war with me. It wasn't that God didn't want to make peace with me. God has always been peaceful. He has constantly wanted 
to reveal peace to us. And peace is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And so it's God himself. Peace, love, joy, patience, kindness. This is the character, the essence, the nature of our, our very God, our Father. And so justification, it, it just has become a word, a the, theological debate. You know, and so many books have been written about justification by faith. And it's like the word grace. Grace has just become, it's like a theological word. And yet grace is more than just a the, theology. Grace, and I've said it before, and I have a message called grace is not a doctrine. It's a person. Grace is a person. Because grace to me, it's the givingness of God. It's God giving, you know, John 3.16. For God so loved the world. He loved the world. You can't escape that. All the people that think that God is angry with humanity and, you know, he has to can't look at them because they're horrible, wicked creatures. You know, nonsense. He has loved humanity. He has always loved humanity. And he has been longing for humanity. That day when we will all be reconciled into that place, that new heaven, new earth, we will we have we will see things clearly. We will fully know him and fully understand him. I mean, what a, an amazing day. But yet, grace has just become a theology, the grace of this, the grace of blessing, the grace of peace, the grace. It's just a word that's thrown around. It's a nice kind of fluffy word for us Christians to use. But grace is a person and that person the givingness of God what did God give God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son he gave us Jesus and Jesus was the gift to us to show us God's creation how much he loved us that he loved us and he loves us and he doesn't stop loving us he's never stopped loving us from that day in the garden when our communion and our closeness with him was broken not because of him but because of us and he has just constantly loved us and longed for that day when Jesus would come and reconcile all things to himself <laughs> Jesus bringing the Holy Ghost sending the Holy Ghost after the resurrection and the Holy Ghost coming and revealing to us the nature and the love of our Father who has always loved us. It's incredible. So grace is not a doctrine. You know, we, we just like justification, we take these words in the Bible. You know, these words weren't meant to, meant to be theological debates. The, theology is good to debate. I'm not saying that. But when we read, when Paul was writing them, he wasn't thinking of a theological argument or a theological debate. Paul was expressing as best that he could with English words or with Greek words or Hebrew words, he was expressing this relationship that he had come to know because of Jesus. And so even with love, love has become just one of those words, a, a theology word now as well. And yet love is just a book on the shelf to many. You know, they pull it down and I'm going to preach on love and I'll just take that book. And, you know, I'm not reading books on love to get my messages. I'm trying to take myself on a journey of discovery of who God is and I'm trying my best to portray what God is revealing to me to you because it's important to know that we are loved everybody wants to be loved and I'll tell you why because God created us for love because it was love that created us and we came out of love and so love is so important not just that fluffy emotional love we get when we feel good and then when we feel bad we don't feel that love that's not the love that's an eros love or a filio love or a stoich love i'm talking about the agape love the unconditional love a love that loves the unlovable the unbearable the the rejected the love that loves all all those who feel rejected feel lonely feel isolated feel forgotten it's love the love of god never forgets the isolated, never forgets the lonely, never forgets the forgotten. And he wants all of those who have felt this way because of sin and because of what sin had done in God's creation. God wants that reality expressed in and through his body, in and through us. And so love, grace, justification, 
it has to become more than words. And the Apostle Paul tells us, if you actually read in, in a Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says that, I am not ashamed of this gospel of grace. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. And you have to understand the words of Paul. Paul basically, when he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, you've got to really get into the heart and the mind of who Paul was. This was a learned Jew, a man who built his whole life on studying scriptures, living perfectly outward. All of the things he did was to appease God, was to justify himself by his own works before God. And so for him to turn around and reject all of his knowledge, to reject all of his works, to reject anything of his like inheritance or his, his heritage, he had to reject all of that and accept that none of that, none of that has brought me into this gospel, this, this relationship. It was grace. God took me, Paul is saying. He took me out of the equation. <laughs> I know, Paul says, that it was the Father and it was the Son who made a covenant with themselves. And so I'm not ashamed to say this, that none of my stuff, everything I built my life upon, it's as cow dung. It means nothing compared to the grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus, I am not ashamed of you. I am not ashamed of your message that you love me and there's nothing I can do in order for you to love me except receive of it and believe that you love me. And that's what Paul did. Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it removes all, all that I've built my life upon, which was like worthless rags. My own righteousness is as filthy rags compared to the righteousness that he has now made me. <laughs> he didn't just, Jesus didn't just come and say, right, Paul, I'm going to cover over all of your wrong with my righteousness now. That'll do you till you get to heaven. No. Paul says, in the book of Corinthians, he says, he has made me the righteousness of God. He's made me, made me the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So he says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel of grace, for this gospel of grace brings hope. You see, the gospel does not tell us about grace. It gave us access into his grace, into himself. We have been brought into a divine romance because of the gospel of this grace. Who wants to be ashamed of such a great divine romance? Who would be ashamed of knowing how greatly they are loved and waking up each day knowing that you are loved? And yet in a love that is in a world that is so loveless, we can awake and face the dawn of every day and receive and live and bask in the love of God. <laughs> Yes, we are loved. You are loved. I am loved. And he wants to get this message. So we don't, we're not just given grace. We've gained access into this grace. We are in grace. And grace is our new abode. And grace is a person, as I said. And the Bible says that we now we are in Christ. And Christ is now in us. That's our new address. The grace of God. We are in Christ. We are in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. And we are in union. And we can bask and fellowship with God because of what Jesus and the Father uh, did in making a covenant to bring us into union, to bring us into fellowship. See the, excuse me. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel of grace because for this gospel brings pure hope. And that's why Romans 5, 5 says, let me read it. He says, and hope, it does not disappoint. <laughs> hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured into our heart. The love of God has been poured into our heart. There's no reason for us to ever be ashamed. You know, in this world, Jesus said, we will have trouble. 
And we are born into a world of trouble. I said this before. We're born into a world of trouble. We're born into a world that is crippled by fear. And so our kids grow up facing rejection, facing fear, facing all sorts of difficulties. And as they get older, they don't get smaller. Those fears get bigger and bigger and bigger. The rejection that we feel gets tougher to face. The isolation we may feel because of the rejection of others gets harder to face. And so trouble comes without us even having to do anything. And then on top of all of that trouble that this broken world brings to the doorstep of our lives, we create our own trouble by doing stupid things and having to suffer the consequences of those stupid choices. And so in this world, we have trouble. But in this world, because of this gospel of grace, we have hope. And Paul says, hope does not disappoint. We don't have to be disappointed because of situations that go on in our life. We don't have to be dis feel disappointed because of the struggles that we face. We can face them because hope does not disappoint. Why? <laughs> because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. The devil is doing a great job himself in spreading his gospel of fear, his gospel of hopelessness. And I feel in me, and I want for you, for us to really get the grasp, or the grasp, the grasp. <laughs> we have to grasp what exactly does it mean when it says that the love of God has been poured into our hearts. That's an unlimited resource of power to overcome in this world. It's an unlimited resource of ability to face the struggles, the temptations, the troubles that we face day to day. The enemy has his message, but we have the greater message because this hope, when all is hopeless, we have the hope that never disappoints. And every man and woman and child deserves to know about this hope that has been poured into our hearts. And so unless we come to understand justification by faith, having peace with God, having the grace of God, living in the grace of God, unless we come to understand the revelation of the knowledge of the great love of God that has been poured into our hearts, our message is stagnant. And then that message of hopelessness that has been spouted out through every different channel you can think of is gaining ground. But God is not going to let that happen. I don't believe that. I believe that a revival of the grace of God through the church, through his people, is awakening right now in the hearts. I have found personally in my own personal life, I've tried doing it by the rules and all that legalistic ways and it killed me. It made me worse than what I was before I became a Christian. I hated myself as a Christian. But when the love of God, <laughs> when the love of God, the grace of God came in to my heart, I found a hope that does not disappoint. It does not disappoint. The love of God will never disappoint you. It fills us with so much hope. It helps us to stay sustained through difficulty. It helps us take that difficulty and come face to face, just like David did with that giant Goliath. We will take the word of God, the precious message of the love of God. We will put it in the catapult that's in our spiritual hand and we will strike that giant down because our hope does not disappoint. Love does not disappoint and love never fails. Love never fails. Jesus was not just speaking. Jesus was not just speaking about grace. Jesus was not just speaking about love. Jesus was not just speaking about the Father. He was coming to reveal grace. He was coming to reveal love. He was coming to reveal 
the Father. And how was he doing that? He was doing that by the Holy Spirit. Because as he revealed the Father in himself to those he ministered to, he sent the Holy Spirit to come to live and abide in you and me. So that we would no longer have to talk a good game. We would not only have to sit down and discuss theology all the time and argue and see who's got the biggest spiritual biceps. No, but in our talking, love is the conductor of our conversation. Love. I'm talking to you about the love of the Father. You're talking to me about the love of the Father. And in that, he is revealing himself in and through each of us as we build each other up in the love and the hope that we have in Jesus. Romans 5, 2 and 3. This is what it says. Romans 5, 2 and 3 says. At the end of, the end of actually uh, verse 2. We exult in hope. And we exult in hope. And that word exult. Or you can actually use the word glory. But the word exult. It says we show triumphant elation. So instead of saying we exult and we show triumphant <laughs> elation. This is what happens when love and the grace of God comes into your heart. When you're awakened to the reality of the love of Father. Not this angry God who stands behind a cloud and can only look at you because of Jesus. No. no. What happens is when the grace and the love of God it, it's, it's revealed in and through us. Because of the love that was poured into our hearts. When we experience, like truly experience. I'm not talking about a couple of worship songs on a Sunday morning. And getting that feel good factor. I'm talking about this deep, deep inner knowing of the love of the Father. It wants to increase and increase and increase and grow in us. Because what it does is. And we with triumphant elation. In hope. So we ex And we. In, we, and we show triumphant elation and we glory in hope. Now, hope to me basically is determined expectancy. So many people are hoping that they'll get a job. So many people are hoping that the car will get fixed. So many people are hoping that the bills will be paid. So many people are hoping, but they have no reality, no substance to that. They don't know if that is actually going to become a reality, if that is going to actually happen. But our hope is a is an assured hope. It's a hope that we, it's like a basically a determined expectant, expectancy that we know what it's about to happen because the Father has revealed, us, revealed it to us. But not only that, the Father has brought us into himself. So we are secure, locked in and loaded and filled with the love of God. And we show triumphant elation and we exult in the determined expectancy in the glory of God. And we exult in hope in the glory of God. And not only this, but we exult, basically show triumphant elation in our tribulation and in our troubles. Meaning we can praise and show triumphant elation. And bring forth praise because he has now shared his glory with us. The word glory actually means the word weight. And I can understand why because there's a weightiness to the presence of God. And there's a weightiness to the glory of God. And you know in the Old Testament where Moses says God would share his glory with no man. I hear Christians still saying that today. The reality is whether you believe this or not, you don't have to believe me. But I'm going to live in the reality of this. Why? Because it causes triumphant elation in me. Because the love of God and the reality of the knowing that he has brought his glory into me and I am in them. We share in the glory of God. He has shared his glory with us. With us. We are his children. And because he has shared his glory with us, he has brought this weight into our life. And why is this weight in our life? Well, I'll simply say it like this. This is not a theology. You can argue this. 
when we live in a world where Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. When we live surrounded by trouble, when we wake up each day knowing that we may face trouble, uh, any, any which way we take, any direction we take, trouble can come. We may not necessarily even start the trouble. It may just come to our doorstep. But the weight of God, I remember years ago, we had this blow up balloon and it went up to about that height. And at the bottom of this balloon, it was basically, it had a weight. And you could stand there and you could punch this balloon, boom, 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 boom. But when you punched that balloon, it went down. But the minute it hit the ground, it came back up again. <laughs> it hit it in the face. But basically, that's what we have in the glory of God. Trouble comes and it will strike us and it will hit us and we may fall down. Sometimes we mightn't fall down, but we may at times fall down. But when we fall down, the weight of glory that's in us causes us to rise back up straight again. Because trouble cannot overcome us. Because Jesus goes on to say, in this world you may have trouble, but take heart. <laughs> take heart, boy, because I have overcome the world. And if you are in me and I am in you, you also have overcome the world. What's wrong? We don't see how he sees. We don't see how he sees. We must see trouble as an opportunity. We can see trouble as an opportunity. An opportunity for what? An opportunity to allow love that was poured out into our hearts. To cause hope to rise in every situation that we face. Knowing that this is just trouble. And when trouble faces our Father and, in the, and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's nothing. It's like a feather being blown by the wind. But we have to see trouble for what it is. It's an, it's an opportunity for us to allow the manifestation of the love of God. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit to produce in us, to produce in us perseverance. Now I want to read on this. He says here, and not only this, but we also exult in our trouble. Think about that. We exult, we exult, we glory in our trouble. I'm not happy that trouble comes to my door. This is not what he's really saying. He's not saying go around with a smile on your face and yay, yay, trouble, praise the Lord is at my door. No, we exult in it. We actually see, we see that we have, we are more than conquerors, basically through Christ Jesus. Because he not only loved us, but he loves us and he lives in us. And he gives us the ability to see above and beyond the trouble. That no trouble is big enough for our God. No trouble. He says, and not only this, but we also exult in tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Now that's a bit strange. Saying that trouble produces perseverance. Now, trouble does not basically bring perseverance into our life. But when we face trouble, perseverance comes by us acknowledging, let me just think this through for a moment. I don't want to say the wrong thing to you. Because so many people think perseverance, when they go through difficult times, that they've got to persevere. And they, in their own strength and ability, oh, I've got to do this, I've got to get through. That's not what it's saying. We don't persevere in the midst of trouble by trying to do it in our own strength. We must draw from the strength of another. And that's from him who lives within. Jesus said, out of our bellies will flow rivers of living water. That living water is the Holy Spirit himself causing life in the midst of chaos. He causes life. He helps us to see what trouble is trying to do. And this trouble, what it will do is, as we depend upon Jesus to be our strength and our sufficiency, in the midst of the trouble. This is what causes us to persevere. 
so many times in my Christian life, so many, and I know so many in yours are Christian lives who are listening today. What does trouble do to many of us when we face it? It causes us to run here, there and everywhere. So many of us run back to drinking when we used to be alcoholics because it helps us to deal with the stress and we can't handle the difficulties that we face. So many return to drugs because the pressure of trying to live out the perfect Christian life is just too much and we don't want to fail and the fear of failure drives us to taking drugs. Isn't that terrible? Rather than the fear of failure driving us to the one who actually can help us overcome, we run away and we hide behind the very things we relied upon in the past to get us through. So many are going to doctors and not having pills. And that is rampant through most homes, a lot of homes. Doctors giving pills out for anything and everything just because you're having a down day. And then they become dependent upon these very things. When yet, when yet, our hope is not found in pills. Our hope is not found in drink. Our hope is not found in drugs. Our hope is found in Christ and Christ alone. And it's so easy to say that. And so many say it. Christ and Christ alone. One of these Reformation speakers. Only Christ. No. It's allowing him to live his life through us. And that only happens by us beginning to surrender to him in a sense. We surrender to his love. You know, surrender is not something. You surrender basically to an enemy. That's what people basically do. But God is not our enemy. When it says that we surrender, it's like I'm giving myself and I'm allowing you to live your life in and through me. I want to live the life of another. I want to live that overcoming life. I want to know that more than conquering life. And the only way for any one of us to do that is to know how much we are loved. Because God has poured his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We need to be asking the Holy Spirit, having a relationship with the Holy Spirit, talking to the Holy Spirit and saying, reveal to me, bring revelation to my life of just how great this love is in me and allow him to reveal the love of the Father in that. Because you see, trouble brings about perseverance because we are not relying on our own ability. We realize we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God. And now love has been poured into our hearts. And because we are growing in this knowing and this understanding and having revelation of this, this is what causes us in the midst of trouble to persevere, knowing that he is bringing us through to the end. And we find that love enables us not to depend on the drugs, the drink and anything else we depended on because we have a source, a great source that was poured into our hearts and it was the love of God. I can't say this enough to any of you. We need to continue to grow in the love of God. We don't have to, we, we have his weight, his glory, his presence and the knowledge of this reality. It brings triumphant reality the knowledge of this reality brings a triumphant reality we have to have that triumphant mindset i'm not talking about thinking about how great we are we must come to the place of knowing how great he is in us he is in us we live in him and he wants to be the source of every situation in our life. Whether it's good, whether the problem is good, or whether the problem is bad. I wouldn't say whether the problem is good, whether it's good or whether it's bad. He wants to be the very source of life to us in every situation. We need a revelation of what he has done, not just for us, but in us. Otherwise, we won't know how to exult and we will persevere. 
And this is what it says here. Let me just tell you this. We must keep reliving in the reality of what happened at the cross. The cross where Jesus died was not just the place where he died. The reality is the cross is the place where we died also with him. And the resurrection was not where Jesus rose from the dead only. That is the place where we rose in him also. And the ascension that happened when Jesus ascended into heaven and was seated at the right hand side of the Father. We also ascended after we died, after we were raised with him. We also ascended with him and that's why it says we are now seated with him in heavenly places. We have a message of hope and with so much hopelessness going on in the world, hope, hope in the love of God is what we have. And there's an acronym for hope and it's helping one person escape. You see the love of God, someone shared the love of God with you. Someone shared the love of God with me. There's a lady called Eileen Kors and she was an American. And when I walked in off the street as a tramp basically, a heroin addict, and I was basically going in looking, looking for some source of hope. But if there was money to be made in it, I'd have probably made it, <laughs> took someone's bag or something. But she walked up to me and she shared the love of Jesus with me. You know, I really didn't hear the words that she said. I just looked into her eyes and it scared me. Because I realised that this woman really believed what she was talking about. <laughs> and it absolutely scared me because... I had never felt this type of love before. I had known a mother's love. I had known a girlfriend's love. I had known the love of a friend. But I had never known this type of love before. And what the, what Eileen Kors did is what she brought me hope. And that hope came in the form of the love of God that was revealed in her. And so when she was speaking to me with words... What I wasn't hearing words. I was feeling this love that was in her for me. And so she helped me with her message of hope about the love of God. Escape the reality that I was in, which wasn't reality. It was a, it was a hell. It was a hell. This was hell to me. This was the life I was living. I woke up every day wanting to take my own life. I was sleeping in a park every day, waking up freezing cold. Bones all crippled, walking, and I'd walk for hours, probably an hour or two, far away as I could, so we could beg some money away from people that knew me. I was living in absolute hopelessness, and Eileen shared the gospel of hope. <laughs> we have this hope inside of us, because God has poured this hope into our hearts. And I really, I don't know how to get this across as much as I want to. There's so much that I want. I want to scream into this camera, to be quite honest. I want to reach in and rip all the hopelessness that's in your mind or in your heart. I would love to rip it out. And I would love to be able to fill it. But it's the Holy Spirit that does that. It's the Holy Spirit. Get to know. Build a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Simply just sit down and talk to Him and say, Holy Spirit, reveal to me the love of the Father. Reveal to me the love of the of Jesus you see the gospel the gospel message when we truly begin to experience it not just will not just have a head knowledge it won't just be a head knowledge but it will be something that will cause us to come in to God's reality the reality of his love see the gospel message is all about the love of the father and the love of the Father was revealed to us through Jesus Christ at Calvary when he laid down his life for you and for me. That was what the love of the Father was about. People say that God had to punish Jesus for us. It wasn't that he had to punish Jesus. They came up with a plan that they said they would, they would come. That God was in Christ reconciling the world. It was God in Christ that was giving of himself to reveal to us just how much he was willing to do to show us how much he loved us and by dying on calvary 
when Christ died for the sins of humanity, when he reconciled the world to himself, when he took all the sin upon himself, when he took the sin of the world, it was love that was being demonstrated. Love was being demonstrated. And love was being demonstrated so that our, our lives in a world so troubled and a world so filled with hopelessness, love was being demonstrated because of hope, bringing hope into a broken world, into a hopeless world. God in Christ Jesus was bringing hope and hope came in the form of love. Love is our hope. Love, the love of God, the love of the Father, the love of the Son, the love of the Holy Spirit. Hope is the fruit of knowing just how greatly we are loved. And it's the Holy Spirit that does it. Let me just say that again. Hope is the fruit of knowing how greatly we are loved. And it's the Holy Spirit that does this. Hope is the fruit of knowing how greatly we are loved. It's time for us to stop. Just put away all that religious nonsense. We've got to do it. You know, we've just got to do it, making up sermons for the sake of it. We've got to do it. We've got to experience this life. We've got to experience this love. People know when you're religious. They know when they're being judged. You may not even know when you're judging them. Because we're so blinded at times. We don't even know sometimes when we're condemning them. We just know that we're not like them. Thank God I'm not like them. You need Jesus to be like me. And that is sick. That is sad when we have that mentality. We need to be, we need to know how much we are loved. Because this message needs to manifest in us. Just like it manifested in that woman oil in when she shared the love of God to me. There was an element of fear. But you know what that did? I remember leaving that church that night. And the next day I went down and I was kicking the doors off that church. Eileen, Eileen, and the caretaker came along. What are you doing? Now the caretaker lived locally. I knew him. It was Leo Tommy, and Leo Tommy's wife worked there as a pastor. And that pastor and Leo Tommy became my father and mother-in-law. I married the daughter years years later, after going to rehab and getting my life on track. I married the daughter, but that was all because of love. Hope, the message of hope was being portrayed in a heart that knew it was loved. And it reached me. It reached me. Let me go on quickly. Let me read verse 5. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And listen to what it says. For while we were still helpless. That word helpless is to be without strength. For while we were without strength. While we were without strength. At the right time. Christ died for the ungodly. For at the right time. While we were without strength. Are you without strength today? I know what it is to be a Christian. And to live without strength. Trust me. I have failed so many times. I've messed up so many times. And I tried to get myself on track. And I tried to fulfill all the laws. And I tried to over, I'd be over praying, over studying, over fasting. Until it branched that I'd be broken again. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't live up to the mark. I was a complete failure. You know, the mark that all these other people say. This was nothing got God put in place. This is what religion did. And I partook of this. We, the best way to talk about this, if you look in, I read about this before. If you look in Psalm chapter 8, it says this Out of the mouth of babes and infants, he has ordained strength. Now, that verse, Jesus, if you look at Matthew 21, Jesus actually uses this same verse 
in Matthew 21. And in Matthew 21, when he's going in, in the, it's called the triumphal entry. Remember that in Matthew 21? And all the children were singing Hosanna. I think it's in verse 13 and 14. And it says, and all the children were praising him and singing Hosanna. And then the Pharisees couldn't take the fact that they were praising him and singing Hosanna to the son of David. They hated the fact that the children were singing this. And Jesus turns when the Pharisees were telling them, telling Jesus to tell them to stop. He says, have you not read? And he reminds them of Psalm 8. And he said, have you not read that out of the mouth of babes and infants, he has perfected praise? Now, the original verse actually says he has ordained strength. But Jesus changes two of the words, ordained strength, and he changes them to perfected praise. I read that some years ago. And what that means is our praise, perfected praise, comes from a heart that is perfectly loved. See, children know when something's real. Ch children know when something is honest. Children are wise enough. They, they, know, they pick it up. And you remember Jesus said, unless one of us comes as a little child, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Because children, it, you know, they depend on the love of parents. They totally surrender to the love of their parents. And that's why it's important for us as parents to love our children as best that we can. We must love them. But a heart that is perfectly loved will perfectly praise. And when Jesus says, out of the mouth of babes and infants, he has perfected praise, he's basically changing the word strength for praise. And basically what he's saying is, our strength is found in our praise. But our praise only comes when we know what Christ has actually done for us. And how much he loves us. Being justified by faith, it's not a theology. Having peace with God is not a theology. Knowing the grace of God is not a theology. The love of God is not a theology. It's God himself. It's life himself. It's love himself living, coming to live in you and in me. And what this does is it causes triumphant elation. And triumphant elation comes out in praise because strength has come into our life when it's difficult. When our all seems hopeless, when we feel like giving up, strength is there. God is there. He is our strength. He is our strength. And because he has become our strength, we can't do anything but praise when it comes. It gets difficult. I went through a difficult time over the last couple of years. Some things just going on. And it, the, the lie comes to your head, just give up. You know, just give up. I, I, I spoke to one or two people. Allowed one or two people in confidence into my life. You know, I'll never give up. I can't. The love of God. <laughs> the love of God won't let you give up. It won't allow you to give up. The love of God becomes a source. It becomes so much life inside of us. And it causes us to stay the course. Because now we're not depending on our own ability and laws and rules and, you know, being obedient and I must do this and I must do that. Get rid of it. It's garbage. We begin to depend on the life of another. Our strength 